<laughs> well, welcome along. Um, it's lovely to see most of you again. <laughs> and um, I thought what we'd do tonight, um, I'm still willing to answer um, your questions, as you had many of them from <laughs> last night, many of you. Um, but also I wanted to involve those of you who are having, I know some of these spirit friends would like to ask some questions as well um, again so if we could also do that if you feel game enough to do that those of you who are uh, okay with the channeling of those spirits um, because that, that uh, will also help uh, describe a lot of the things in terms of the interaction between human spirits animals and all of those kind of things and how everything interacts together so we'll do that as well tonight so welcome you were first, Julie. That's a lot of projection coming from you, <laughs> but I'll accept it on this occasion. <laughs> Use the microphone if you can so we can hear you properly too. Um, is there such um, a thing or entities as angels? Uh, yes. Yep. As distinct from spirits? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> so different sorts of spirits are they? Or? Um, I suppose the question really is what kind of entities actually exist in the mm. universe that I've met at least. Um, so let, let's uh, look at the different types of entities. Well, firstly, in, on Earth, um, if you look at living creatures, um, you've got everything, everything from single-celled through to uh, mammals, and then you've got the human mammal, who is often called, uh, which is uh, far more than that, obviously. And then you've got a lot of things happening in the spirit world too. So what I'd like to do, perhaps, as a complete answer, is describe all of those different things. How does that sound? So let's look firstly on Earth. You, you've got a range of living creatures right the way through, a sing, uh, through the single cell, right the way through to the highest form of mammal. So... Uh, how do you spell mammal? Ale. Ale. And, um, and, and all of those creatures are actually under the control of the human soul. So um, right from the single cell. So, so you know, for example, um, a virus, for example, is totally under the control of the human soul. And the reason why a virus impacts upon us negatively is because of our negative emotions that we're storing in the soul that affect the action of the virus. Um, our body is totally capable of healing everything and totally capable also of absorbing anything, um, but, but only when we have a completely free emotional condition. So only that's only ever going to occur when we're at one with God, obviously, uh, that we get into that state. Then there's, of course, man, mankind, or humankind, shall I call them, just add to the woman there. And human, the human form um, is very, very different to any other form. So we get single cell uh, creatures right the way through to a mammal. And in between that stage, there is actually a stage where we talk about creatures that are, have a central nervous system. And the creatures that have a central nervous system all have a spirit body. So... For example, most of the mammals, like horses, dogs, cats, and all those kind of animals, obviously all have a spirit body. They all have a central nervous system. And, and the only creatures on Earth that don't have a spirit form, a spirit body, are the creatures that don't have a central nervous system. Does that make sense to everyone? So the central nervous system uh, determines whether they have a spirit form as well, a spirit body, if you like, as well as a material body. So the, the truth is that when an, an animal, for example, procreates, two bodies are actually created there as well, just like it is with the human form, with the exception that the animal does not have a soul. Um, so the animal has a spirit form, but not a soul. And the animal, it, it, its, it's uh, actions and all of the illnesses that it uh, attains and every other thing that happens in its life is all the reflection of the soul condition of the people surrounding the animal. And if it's, a, if it's a domestic animal, it's a reflection of the soul condition primarily of its closest attachment, which is usually its so-called owner. And, uh, and so our cats, dogs and other, and other domesticated animals, 
have a, are a complete reflection, how they act is a complete reflection of our soul condition and how, what illnesses they get are also a complete reflection of our own soul condition, our own denied emotions, in other words. So humankind is very, very different to all the other types of animals in that humans have a soul. And I've talked to you about the soul yesterday and what the soul is. And remember, we're half as a soul, so that's... Uh, and, you know, the soul mate is the other half of the soul. And combined as one, we are one being, actually, the human soul. And when we incarnate, we split into two and we become two bodies for the, the feminine half, in my, our soul's case, and two bodies for the masculine half. Now, that's, that's a very different creature than any other creature that exists in the universe. The human soul is actually the highest creation of God and there is no higher creation of God than the human soul. And the human soul is the only creation of God, actually, that's, been, that's given free will. And, so, um, and as a result, the human soul has the capacity to create evil as well as good, uh, just by that, uh, the gift of free will. So when we pass into the spirit world, of course, we are still a spirit body attached to our half of the soul. And then as we progress through the dimensional existences, and I'll just draw them sort of, in a shortened version, up until the 21st dimensional existence, we still remain a half of a soul with the human, uh, with the human form attached in a spirit, in the spirit body. And then we go through a process of union with our soulmate, which, which this has all been building up towards, when we recombine, our, our soul recombines as it was in its original state, but now with full capacity to understand, learn, and, and also understand itself. In other words, it's been completely individualised at that, at, that, at that point. So at this point, we, the, the, the process of individualization is complete. It began at the moment of your incarnation, and it's complete at the moment of the soul union. So... So the spirits who are still in the sixth dimension of the spirit world who are yet to receive divine love or have only received a certain portion of divine love but can't progress above that point in the sixth sphere, they will never experience the completed process of individualization until they continue in their progression receiving divine love. Now, in the spirit world, there are other creatures that you can create. So there is literally a infinite variety of creatures that exist in the spirit world that you would call animals here on earth but in the spirit world look very and vastly different to what we've seen on earth historically or even currently because you actually have the capacity in your soul to create a form an animal form and actually have it infused with life just from a prayer to god you can infuse the animal form with life and the animal comes alive and so, so there are literally like billions and billions and billions of different types of creatures in the spirit world that are not human souls, but we would classify the same as what we classify as animals here on earth. Now, the term angels, and the reason why I'm saying uh, all of these things is we need to understand where everything came from. So as we progress as a soul... Once we enter that at one state, remember the at one state occurs when we are in the eighth dimension and the transition occurs between the seventh and the eighth dimensions, uh, or the eighth sphere dimension. Um, the process of becoming at one with God, you become an angel. So all of the so-called angels that you hear about, uh, there, and by the way, there are many spirits in the spirit world who claim to be angels but who are actually in the sixth sphere or below. In fact, I know many spheres, spirits in the first sphere who claim to be angels to people on earth, but are nothing like an angel in their emotional makeup. So a person who you would classify as an angel, and the way that all the spirits refer to angels, any person who is above the seventh sphere, in other words the eighth sphere, or above in their development, is an angel. So... The human soul at that point is transformed into the divine creature, basically. 
as a half of a soul and then on the 21st dimension it makes the union with itself and therefore the entire soul is a divine creature and is classified as an angel. Now in this condition you can have literally hundreds of thousands of bodies that you can materialize from your own soul. So you can actually interact with hundreds of thousands of different people as if you're a person under the 22nd dimension. But when you interact with another soul in the 22nd dimension, you interact soul to soul. So they can see you as your complete form. But the people underneath that dimension don't see you as a complete form. They actually start, they, they look at a body that you've actually uh, oftentimes materially created, but that body is just an expression of your soul. It's not actually you. Um, so, so you get to the stage in the 20, 22nd dimension where you can actually create thousands of bodies at will, uh, male or female, because obviously there's masculine and feminine qualities in the soul itself, and, and interact with people at any condition underneath, or any dimension underneath the dimension in which you exist. So when you get to that space, the 22nd sphere space, you're considered to be in a soul union condition. And nobody has progressed beyond that condition at this point, but it is known, based on previous experience, that we will progress beyond that condition, that dimension as well, at some point in the future, uh, just as we have up until that condition. Now, now in these, any one of these places, there are what you would classify here on Earth as animals, but what in the spirit world you see as beings, that actually don't have souls, but are the expression of God's soul. So um, when humankind didn't live on earth, there was a time when the human soul was not present on earth, but when animals, birds, uh, and insects, uh, and not just the, all living creatures existed, but without mankind. Now in that condition, God's energy drove the direction of those animals, birds, and so forth. So the entire ecosystem was set up by God's feelings and God's energy. So God, who, who no one has actually physically seen, although when you get into this condition, you perceive God with what you would call your soul perceptions to the most, clari to the most clarity. Yeah. Per yeah. Perceptions. And that is, that is actually clearer than seeing a person like you see a person now. But... but from an eye's perspective, the soul has... What we have now in our physical form is just a very small subset of what the soul's capability is of seeing things and what the soul's capability is of learning. So, so the angels begin... are uh, just people who have lived on earth and there, is, there are no other souls in the spirit world other than people who have had firstly a human existence. But there are lots of other beings that don't have a soul that you would consider here on earth as, um, as animals which exist in the spirit world and far more variety than, than you would ever conceive of here on earth. But there's no soul in, the, in any dimension that hasn't already existed on earth. Yeah. It's not working, so I'm saying it. Is it what's working? Is it working? Yeah. So did you hear what Mary just said? I just said that there's no soul in any of the dimensions of the spirit world that hasn't already incarnated on the earth. But they may not have had a very long existence on earth. For example, they may have had a miscarriage or had an abortion uh, and been the product of an abortion or a miscarriage and those souls are still considered incarnate and therefore still have, have begun the process of individualization. So they still had a process that happened on earth even though they may have died shortly afterwards. And sometimes shortly afterwards might have only been one day or two days or three days after incarnating. So there are many spirits in the spirit world who certainly have not had an earth-based life after a, a full term of pregnancy. And they are still in the spirit world and have the, process, have the uh, ability to progress just like any other soul. They arrive in what's called Summerland in the spirit world and they are nursed by uh, spirits who take care of children who are yet to be developed. To develop. and, uh, and by the time of three or four or five years of age, many of them 
uh, have learned how to become a one with God if they follow that path, but they're given free will to choose what path they wish to follow, whether they want to follow the natural love path or the divine love path. So many of those spirits, when they come back to talk to you, they will say they didn't live on earth. But, and, and in reality, that is a truth to a degree in that you know, they, they weren't born on the planet and therefore they didn't live here, but they were incarnated into a, into a mother on the planet, uh, but shortly thereafter experienced the termination of the pregnancy in some way. Um, so there's quite a lot of those spirits. And in fact, there's actually 50 billion, million of those spirits every year that arrive in the spirit world. Yeah. Uh, if we use the microphone, because we're recording. So can those spirits still attach to us, the ones that have of course, been yeah, of course. aborted? Unfortunately, or... what happens in the spirit world is there are a group of spirits who are in the first and second sphere primarily who believe in reincarnation. And these spirits believe that the only way these children can actually have a life of progression in the spirit world is by reincarnating. And if one of these spirits gets a hold of the child and starts teaching it the teachings that it believes, then the, then the young spirit will often attempt to reincarnate into another human form. But the only problem with that is that it can't do it. And what it does is finishes up sharing a body with somebody else who's already incarnated. In other words, what you would nowadays call a possession is what many of these spirits are attempting to do all the time. And so this is why many children actually get uh, child or, or diseases even in the womb nowadays. And the reason why this occurs is usually because of spirit attachments um, by spirits who are attempting to reincarnate because they're in a terrible condition in the spirit world and they want to come back and live another life on earth. So, so in the spirit world and on earth, the teaching of reincarnation has very many negative effects, actually. It yeah. can also cause a lot of gender confusion. Because mm -hmm. often children. they try to connect with the opposite gender. So in other words, a, a young baby just born, a female child gets overcloaked by a male spirit, now it's going to have a huge amount of gender confusion. Yeah, it's a major problem on the earth. Yeah. Um, do the, oh, I'm trying to say, are they likely more to attach to like a similar sibling, sort of in that family? Uh, sometimes that can be the case, Perhaps. but... but the majority of attachments don't occur by children who have been aborted or who have been miscarried. The majority of times these are looked after by spirits on the divine love path. Early days, in early times, when there weren't spirits on the divine love path, they were looked after by highly developed natural love spirits. But now the, uh, a large majority of the children are looked after by divine love spirits who then manage what you would think of nowadays as, uh, like here on earth, as sort of like orphanages they manage. Um, but it's done in a far better way than any uh, that are done here on earth. And the person who manages the orphanage is a person usually uh, uh, quite well developed, usually in the celestial spheres on the divine love path. And while they may have many natural love helpers in that place, the person who's actually managing the place generally is on the divine love path. Yeah. So, so in answer to your question, an angel is a person above the eighth sphere who has lived on earth. But when I say have lived on earth, I'd have to clarify that and say it can also be a person who's just had a very brief incarnation on earth for a period of even a few hours or a day or so and then has experienced a miscarriage or an abortion in some way um, and who has then learnt how to progress into the eighth sphere through their teachers in the spirit world teaching them how to do so. So, so that particular spirit, while it uh, is still a human soul, has not really had very much of a life here on earth or a life experience here on earth that it can recall. Yeah. Now, guard, well, guardian angels, two types of uh, so-called, from the New Age uh, perspective, uh, angels that people feel they have. And, uh, and they are very different to what I'm describing as angels. There are your guardians and your guides. Now, your guardian has the role of actually just protecting your incarnation. So what they do, to the best of their ability, given the laws at their disposal, is they try to actually protect the child throughout its developing life and into its adult life, and, and through, usually throughout its entire life. So you could think of, here I am in the, on the earth, here's me, here's my soul, here's my spirit body, 
here's my physical body and I've got this person in the spirit world and it may be a male or a female who is a guardian of my soul. In other words, what they're trying to do is guard me from danger so that I don't prematurely pass. Now, at the moment, that's quite a difficult job because there are a lot of very negative things that happen on earth that cause premature passing from disease right the way through, from abortion, disease, and lots of other types of, uh, lots of, other types of problems, obviously. So it's a very difficult job for the guardian to try to protect the person throughout an entire lifetime. Um, th so their role is more a uh, protective role, the guardian role. And the person who's given that role may, may be only a second sphere spirit or a third sphere spirit, or uh, it doesn't have to be a spirit at one with God. It will often be a natural love spirit who's given the role of a guardian rather than a spirit on the divine love path. And they know their role, they love the person often and feel a deep rapport with them due to personality generally. Personality, or sometimes they've been a member of their family yeah, yep. that's passed. Yep. And, uh, and they may not be in high development spiritually, so in terms of their own reflection of love. They, of course, are still growing themselves. So, so they are growing themselves and part of their growth is actually learning how to actually be a guardian of somebody on earth. Um, myself, I was a guardian uh, of, of a person on earth. Um, in, in, I've only been a, a guardian of one person on earth, actually, in my entire existence. And that was my daughter, um, Sarah. We had a daughter in the first century, and I was her guardian. Um, so so um, I, I have experienced that role myself. Um, and it can be quite a difficult role, uh, given the different constraints that are upon the person on the earth and the different laws involved, it can be quite difficult to protect that person their entire life. And um, Then there is the spirit who is also assigned as a guide, who can also be a male or a female. And there can be a number of guides that a person attracts. Now, this is based around the law of attraction upon the, of the person. So that your law of attraction determines who is your guide or your gu uh, who is your guide. And by law of attraction, it's particularly what you're interested in on your earth-based life from a spiritual perspective that determines how you're guided from the spirit world. So let's say I, um, let's say I as a person, went along and I, and I grew up in the Catholic religion, for example, here on earth. What would happen most probably is I would automatically have a Catholic religious guide in the spirit world, right? Because my longing is to remain a Catholic, so... I'm, attract, I'm going to attract a Catholic religious guide. Now, obviously, that guide is not going to be, if, they, if there's a chance and, and sometimes a high likelihood most of the time, that that person hasn't developed until at one moment with God. And so, so why we call them our guardian angels, they're not really angels yet because they have yet to make the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere themselves. But, but they have a role of guiding us because of our desires. And every single person on the planet has a series of people surrounding them regarding and guiding you. So if you're a scientist, for example, then you will often have a, sign, a person in the spirit world who's also a scientist guiding you. If you're a Catholic or a Protestant or a Muslim or Hindu, you'll often have the same. When you, become, when you get onto the divine love path, your guide is then selected by God directly and is given to you based on your desires. So often during your progression on the divine love path, your guides will change quite uh, uh, markedly. There'll be emotions that come up inside of you that you need to deal with, and you'll generally then be assigned a guide on the divine love path who's in the spirit world, who may not yet be an angel yet, but still on the divine love path. And, and that particular guide might have already dealt with, dealt with those group of emotions that you're facing. And so what that guide does is that guide's with you trying to assist you to go through those same emotions that he or she has experienced. So that's the role of the guardian and the guide. Yeah. Um, you wanted to say that? Oh, it's also worth mentioning, it, um, and I think I joked with Deidre about it yesterday, that um, so for each of us, we, if we're on a spiritual path, we definitely have a guide. Sometimes before then, we just have a guardian. Um, but once we start to have a spiritual longing in our lives, we'll attract a guide or a number of guides to, according to our desire and which direction we want to go. But also with all of us, at most times, 
there are just other spirits with us based around the law of attraction. So if I'm a woman carrying a lot of injury, say anger with men, through the law of attraction, just as happens with my friendships with other women, also a number of spirits can be with me who carry the same emotions. Um, and we're together because we make each other feel okay about this emotion. And it can be based on a number of other things. But that's quite a um, significant thing that um, I have discovered on this path because very often they want to keep us in this place because it makes them... Yeah, they can be malevolent or even they feel oftentimes they're benevolent. Yes. They feel they're, they doing feel you they're a your friend. And yeah. being your friend. It's like a whole group of women getting together and, and complaining about their husbands. Each one of those women believe they're doing their other friends a favour, but in reality... The way to get rid of them is to own the emotions inside of us. So it's through the, the denial of our emotions or wanting to hold on to the emotions that are out of harmony with love that attract them because they want to stay in the same place as well. As soon as we start to own our stuff and say, I want to deal with this and release this, they're, they can't really hang around much. They're not interested. They'll go and find another woman who wants to bitch about their husband. Yeah. Now, now, one thing to bear in mind with all of this is if you're a medium, often what you're feeling is not... Uh, so, so if you go along to a medium, often they'll tell you, oh, you've got this guide or this guardian, and actually the person is not your guide or guardian at all, but some. rather a, a spirit who's either benevolent or malevolent surrounding you based on one of your law of attraction emotions that you've yet to heal. And often the medium on earth is unable to feel the difference between your guide or guardian because of their own... Because if the medium's condition is only in the first sphere, for example, they're going to feel the persons in the first sphere the strongest and they're hardly even, they're hardly even going to be able to acknowledge a person in one of the higher spheres. And so oftentimes what we notice is when people say, oh, oh my, a medium told me that uh, my guardian is this particular person. I, uh, so I'm sorry, that person's not your guardian at all. That person's actually a malevolent spirit who's been influencing life quite negatively for quite some time and it's because of this particular emotion that you're attached to that spirit. And, and this happens very frequently where, where people on earth are told by mediums on earth about a particular spirit and that spirit is, uh, is assumed to be benevolent and a guide or a guardian of the person when in reality the spirit is quite malevolent or at least influencing the person negatively and, and is not actually their guide or guardian and their guide or guardian sitting up in another location in the spirit world in fair bit of frustration sometimes if they're not yet at one with God going I wish I could get rid of this spirit that's influencing my, my charge you know so um, a lot of times we see on earth uh, untruth given by a medium to a person actually finishes up influencing the person's desires to attract spirits that are negative even stronger, more strongly than they had before. And that's a very damaging process. Also the process of, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, past, life past life regression. Attracts very, very negative spirits oftentimes to, to it. And as a result, these spirits become attached. Now, what happens is that if I'm sitting down in a, in, in a therapist's room, that therapist often has thousands and thousands of spirits who, are, who want to connect to people on earth on a permanent basis. And what happens is the therapist then puts you into a, a semi-state of hypnosis or a state where you're open to spirits. What happens is that basically you go out of body, a spirit comes in and starts talking to the therapist. Now, the therapist starts assuming that that spirit who's talking to them is actually you in a past life. And the, that assumption creates actually a stronger bond of attraction between yourself and that spirit. And often that spirit will then continuously follow you around for a lot of your life from that point on, when you didn't even have trouble with that spirit before then. And this is a problem with a lot of the different types of therapies that are used on the planet today that are based around the New Age teachings, is they don't know the full truth and often create more problems than they solve or resolve. And, but in terms of the answer of what creatures are there, everyone's fine with the creatures that are there? Yeah? Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you could just clarify. Um, I'm, I'm totally understanding the concept of a guide. What I'm um, not understanding is the concept of that we need any sort of protection or there is someone that can protect us and also the concept of asking God for protection when all God's laws are in place 
and our law of attraction is all done through God's love to show us where we are. Yep. So when someone white lights us or asks us to do a protection ritual or you've got guardians that protect you, what, what, is, what are we being protected from when there's nothing to fear? Well, the, the guardian for a start never white lights you or any of those kind of things. Um, that is very much a new age type of teaching and it's a very temporary process at best anyway because what finishes up happening is a group of spirits who are not following God's laws finish up protecting you so that, so that you don't get harmed. And this is what happens quite a lot in the spirit world. There's a lot of spirits on the natural love path who are still breaking God's laws to a large degree and a lot of the protective forces they offer are actually still breaking God's laws to a large degree. So basically, if, you, if you're, um, you know, white-lighting yourself or, um, you know, calling in your band of angels to protect you, you're, you're trying to circumvent the law of attraction there. Mm. What your guardian would be more likely to do is to give you that, you know, the feeling of intuition that you have sometimes, like, actually, this doesn't feel that safe for me right here. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not... Um, removing the situation and it's not removing your awareness of what your law of attraction is bringing you but it's maybe heightening that awareness and saying okay there's something for me to look at here I might just remove myself or maybe I should check the brakes in the car or whatever that that is and so if, if a therapist has offered um, the service out of out of love to protect you and to, to cloak you into things, you know, the whole new age thing that... Yep. But I know that people have done that with my daughter, like they've just gone, she needs, I'll do... And I was like, I don't want any protection rituals. And they say, well, that's my, that's my, my love. I feel like I want to protect her. And I'm, is it really doing anything or just let... Like, I, I'm not... Uh, I don't have an understanding on that level. Can I just make a statement for a start? The person saying that to you is not honouring free will for, for a start. So therefore, how can they be being loving? So they may, they may be assuming what they're doing is actually loving, but actually what already just them staying to, well, that's my, what I want to do, so I'm going to do it even though you've asked them not to, is straight away an unloving act. Now, now, if that's the way it is, then, then they think they're being loving, but they're actually right at that moment, not, not actually honouring one of God's laws, which is the law of free will and also the law of responsibility of parents with children. Uh, they're not, they're not honouring quite a number of laws, actually, in that particular moment. So just because a person thinks they're loving, it doesn't mean they're loving. That's the first thing to understand. Secondly, um, with regard to a lot of these things, we need to... Your question is based around, like... How, how, you know, why do we need protection was the question really. Let's look at why you need protection, shall we? Like, why you need protection is because here you are sitting in the middle of this room right now and here's your spirit body right now sitting here and here's your soul and your soul is full of different emotions and desires, some of which are harmonious with love and some of which are not harmonious with love. Does that make sense? Now, every one of those emotions and desires not in harmony with love creates a negative law of attraction for yourself. In the, when I say a negative law of attraction, it's always positive, of course, because it's God's law, but you see it as a negative. Like, you know, like what comes to you feels like, oh, that felt terrible. I had a car accident today. That didn't feel very good. Not understanding that actually it was one of your emotions or desires that created that accident in some way. Now, now what the guardian's role if you like, is, is the guardian can see far more than what you can see. The guardian can see, firstly, the emotions and desires you have that are disharmonious with love. Secondly, they can see all of the attractions that that causes, both from the spirit world and also from the physical world, right, in terms of people that are attracted to you through these emotions and desires, often that you can't see. They can even see the ones that are about to happen, it, usually within the next two or three days, but uh, uh, depending on the development of the guardian, sometimes they can see it for the next six 12 to 12 months or even longer based on where your desires are, where everyone around your desires are, what kind of things are happening in your life and so forth. And they can also see, because of these emotions and desires, they can see what car you drive, right? And what the problem is with the car you're driving. And they can see a lot of other things that you're not actually aware of right now. Now, God's placed them in this position so that, as a way to help you as an individual live 
long enough to actually come to terms with these emotions without passing first and passing into a, into a negative condition. So, so the, the guardian's role and guide's role, if you like, and particularly in this case the guardian's role, is to protect you as you experience your incarnation from all the things that you are not yet aware of. Now, as you become personally more and more self-aware and as you become more and more knowledgeable about the spirit world, knowledgeable about the laws involved, and like if, for many of us, if we thought about the law of attraction, for example, many of us probably didn't even know what it was 10 years ago and then we read, heard the secret maybe and we thought it was about that and now you're hearing this and you realise it's a lot more involved with that. So, so you can see over a long period of time we've developed, if you like, individually, on that one law alone. So way back at the time when we didn't even know about the law of attraction, um, there were lots of things happening in our lives that, uh, which could have caused our death. And this guardian is always trying to prompt you with intuition in particular, in terms of uh, intuition, in order to avoid specific things occurring in your life so that you could have a bit longer life and a bit longer experience here on earth because it's actually your life experience here on earth that helps you so much in the spirit world. And they would love you to live a good, good life on earth where you come to terms with things, qualities such as faith, love, you know, compassion, kindness and all these qualities as these qualities develop. Because as these qualities develop inside of you, what finishes up happening is when you pass into the spirit world, all of those qualities don't need to be developed there because you already have them and, and that will make your progress in the spirit world much more rapid. So, so God's provided these guides and guardians because of our desire to walk away from God. So even in her love, what she's done, she said, all right, you guys are walking away from me, that's fine. What I'm going to do is do as much as I can still to help you even though you don't want to acknowledge me. Right? And if you think about it, that's an act of love too. It's like a father or a mother saying to their child, even though you don't want to acknowledge me, I'm still going to try to help you via friends and via other people, not control you, but help you, so that, so that eventually you want to come back to me. And that's really what God's doing with these, with these spirits. And if you contrasted that with um, someone white lighting someone? Yeah, yeah. well, white light, what does white lighting somebody do? What it does is it temporarily places a protective barrier around your soul by some spirits coming to you who are on the natural love path, but not on the divine love path, because a spirit on the divine love path would never do this with you. Um, and what they would do is they would form a protective shield around you. Now, what that does is temporarily make it look like your law of attraction no longer has any negative parts to it. And, and what does that do? It puts you into a false sense of security about your own soul condition. So you then so, can grow throughout the rest of your life thinking you're in a fantastic soul condition, which, by the way, many mediums themselves feel they are in very good soul condition. And then when they pass, they experience the terrible shock of reality. And then as they look in the mirror and see this degraded form and wonder why they're in such terrible condition. And it's because of this so-called protection that was offered by spirits who didn't really know what they were doing and creating much more longer-term damage. Because by preventing that law of attraction that we now all see as a gift, um, because they're not receiving that gift of feedback on their own soul condition, they can continue to act in very unloving ways, continually degrading their loving. soul condition, being protected and, and not realising what, what's actually happening. Yeah. And a case in point is how a, spirit, a medium can say to you, oh, I'm going to do it even if you don't want it. Yeah. What's that? That is them directly harming your free will. And I, I, feel, I feel I'd love to have a, a tool that I can feel empowered dealing with the spirit world, even though I, I obviously in my knowledge of it isn't great except for what, what I've learnt from you, but how to still empower, like how do I take that away even if I can't see it? I don't even know it's there, but if it is... Well, this is the beauty of your emotional development, is as you become more and more sensitive at your soul, you, will, you don't need to see spirits. In fact, seeing spirits is highly overrated, um, as, is, as is hearing them. It's also very highly overrated. The truth is, remember yesterday we talked about a soul-to-soul -soul interaction with spirits? Now, you can, on earth, and you give an illustration of this, on earth, you can see a very beautiful person walk up to you and outwardly they can appear very beautiful and they're saying all the right words to you, you know, oh, I love you and I care about you and they're saying all these things. You've actually had an experience of this in your own life, right? 
where they're saying all the right words and everything to you, but then they act very unlovingly to you. Now, if you could have felt their emotion rather than just looked at the form and hear their words, you would have been able to tell at the moment they were talking to you whether they actually were being truthful to their own condition or not. Does that make sense? So the most powerful gift that any person can ever have that it comes from God and th through this reception of love is this gift to be able to determine between good and what we call good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad, or what we, let's, let's call it what it really is, love and a lack of love, love and fear. And, and, and our ability to determine that is dependent upon our soul condition. So the best possible thing you can do is grow your soul condition and you'll be able to walk up to a person and go, whoa, I'm feeling pretty bad here. Something's going, oh, there's a sexual sleaziness coming from him. He's actually quite sexually angry. Wow, he's quite sexually manipulative. Do I want to you know, engage you with this person? You're knowing that if you've got this person who's sexually manipulative, there's a high likelihood there's going to be some kind of thing going on where he is going to try to or attempt to manipulate you sexually in some way. Does that make sense? Because spirits can do exactly the same thing as people. Mm. Say all the right words and to some degree make their form look even more beautiful. Um, they can project an image of their form which is totally the opposite of what their form actually is. Totally but if different. you're connected with yourself and your own emotions then you can discern that much. Yeah. So if you can feel any person and any spirit, can you see the advantage of that? The spirit comes to you and you go, wow, you're feeling pretty dark. Like, what's wrong with you? You've got a lot of sadness. There's a lot of fear in you, a fair bit of anger. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what you could do because you could feel their emotion. But if you just hear the voice in your ear of a spirit talking to you and he's saying, oh, I know all about love and divine love and all this kind of stuff. You don't think he's on the divine love path? Think is the operative word because if you could feel him, you'd know straight away that he isn't on the path. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this is why often hearing a spirit or seeing them is highly overrated. The, the best possible thing you can develop in yourself is to feel a person, is to feel what they really are and what's really going on inside of the person themselves. And if you can allow yourself to do that, then you'll be able to be sensitive enough to determine which spirit, what, what condition they're in, what person on earth, what condition they're in, and whether you want to engage in them or not, yeah, with them or not. Um, can we come over? Yeah. So continuing on, along that line, mm -hmm. so the best gift we can give our children is to keep them into that feeling state. Well on. Well on. Because I asked a question about my daughter who's Yesterday. been... Yep. Yes. But yep. she does feel people. She's yes. very... Even though she sees spirits, but yep. it's more... So she never, has feeling never, state. never turn off that gift. Every child has it. You'll notice them even when they're a tiny baby. There was a baby that just, uh, one, one year old child that was just brought in with us earlier and he's just observing me very intently. Uh, you know, different people hold him and he turns around and observes me a bit more intently like, because he's feeling things, you see. And children have the ability to feel things all the time, all the time. And uh, often as adults what we do is we start depressing or suppressing that ability they have in favour of the intellect. But that's the most damage you can do is to do something to suppress the feeling state in favour of the intellect because when you when you get to the intellect what do you have to what do you have then to determine a person's condition how they look how they act how what they say what they seem to do but behind the scenes they could be looking acting saying and all all totally different things and a person who can feel that knows straight away and that's the beauty of that gift so would it, would it then also be possibly true that if, if, if in the past you have thought that they've uh, felt a lot of sadness or a lot of negativity about people, probably because it's true, and, and or a lot of the spirits that perhaps I'm attracting are in that first two spheres. So, yep. To be frank, the most of us attract spirits who are in the lower two spheres. And, and the issue we face is if we have a child who, can, who is reflecting the emotion of the spirit attachment, then I can say straight away, all right, that spirit's sad. What inside of me is attracting a sad male spirit? Oh, I have an emotion as a woman that I've got to cheer up a sad man. You know, that might be the emotion, that's your law of attraction. You deal with that particular emotion, all of a sudden that sad male spirit's not there anymore and neither is your child feeling the sadness of that sad male spirit anymore. 
And so this is where it's very great. It's great if you've got a child who can, who can actually know and feel what's going on around you because you can work on a lot of emotions very rapidly. By the way, animals have the same effect too. So, so if the animal is getting some kind of sickness or illness or acting in strange ways and things like that, it's usually because of our... When I say usually, it is always because of our own law of attraction as to what's going on. So let's look at how, the, is the animal just all of a sudden frightened for no reason? Then, they, then just assume, there must be a spirit here who's quite scary and I'm scared of it. I'm scared of this spirit. I can feel that spirit here and I'm afraid of him uh, or her, depending on what gender it is. And, and the animal is just acting out my denied emotion. See, every time I suppress the emotion, my children and my animals will reflect that emotion I'm uh, suppressing back to me. So, and so one way we can heal our children from anything is by actually owning the emotion that they're having to reflect back to us. As soon as I own it, the child no longer reflects it. So I've jumped in cars with people who have two or three children and you know, one of the children turns to me and says, I hate you, AJ. You know, like, and I just go to the parents, which one of you is feeling that way towards me at the moment? You know? <laughs> Obviously I know which one it is generally, but it's a good question to ask anyway and it gets them to think. And, and one of them finishes up owning up, yeah, I'm not too impressed with you at the moment. <laughs> and the child is just reflecting that emotion. And as soon as the child reflects that emotion and the parent then owns the emotion, the child then is fine. Like, the child will jump on my lap after that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So the, the, the child is comp completely reflecting the parent's denied emotion. So whenever we as a parent deny the emotion, the child is going to act it out until we acknowledge what's going on. And that's the beauty of having children, one of the most beautiful uh, things about having children in fact. And so the children can actually help us get to a point where we release our emotions that, and they help bring us to an awareness of what emotions are actually there. So when a child is doing something that's really annoying or really frustrating or really, you know, or crying and it makes you afraid or any of those things, it's all because of our own denied emotion that that particular event is occurring. And any spirits that come around that the child feels are also about our denied emotion. And obviously as the child grows, then eventually its own law of attraction starts taking over. So by the time the child is 8, 9, 10, 11 and into their teenage years and starting having a lot of their life away from us, obviously their own law of attraction now is starting to take over. But, but if you can t teach them the openness, they'll be able to walk into a room like this and go, wow, this is dangerous and walk straight back out. They don't have to even question why they felt it was dangerous. They would just act upon this intuition they feel because they could feel certain persons in there that could hook into their unhealed emotions and know that for, this, for them it's actually not good to be there and, they, and just leave. And then you never have to worry about danger for your children ever, er, anymore either because, uh, because now you know that they are sensitive to everyone's emotion. It's highly unlikely they're ever going to be found in a location that's damaging to them. And, uh, and, and therefore damaging to um, how you feel about them as well. So yeah, it's just a powerful way of dealing with everything. AJ, I experience sometimes where my, uh, when I'm lying in bed where my body's jerked forward or to the side and it sort of over time I've worked out, you know, like I can ask a question and it's like jerked forward for yes or to the side for no or something like that. And, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what's happening. Um, usually these are spirits who are in quite, uh, they're in quite fearful places um, that are attracted to you probably because of some mediumistic ability that they notice in you, that they can communicate with you. But because of their inability to communicate even verbally to you, they have to affect your body in order to communicate with you. Mm. And, and that's, that's better than them not being able to communicate at all. And if you can think of every interaction you have with a spirit as a way of being able to either learn something from them or teach something to them, or usually both, uh, is what actually really happens, and then engage them in a conversation and, and allow them to move your body around in response and get to the point of even showing them how to verbally communicate to you rather than actually moving your body and things like that then eventually you can help them grow. So it really is just how much afraid you are of whether you want to do that or not. And of course you have the choice to not do that and if you choose to not do that, all you need to do is pray to God that you don't want to be influenced by that particular spirit anymore 
And uh, the act of prayer brightens your body so much that most darker spirits can't cope with uh, being around you anyway. The danger is, is when you rely on them for your growth, uh, which is what a lot of people do. They receive a message and think, oh, I'm receiving a message, I should follow that when in many cases that's uh, not a very helpful thing to do. So my recommendation is if you're not sensitive to your own emotions, then you're certainly not going to be sensitive to a spirit's emotions. So therefore, if you are mediumistic, you need to be very, very careful what you're trusting. Because if you can't feel the emotional condition of the spirit, then it can be a spirit in any condition that's communicating with you, even though the spirit is using the words that you like to hear. It doesn't mean that their emotional condition is actually meeting the words that they're saying. And if you think about it, that makes sense because yeah. here on earth, people do exactly the same thing, don't they? You know, all, all of the people who have, ever, who have ever ripped off anybody have all lied to them at some point about how they were going to do this for them and do that for them and create all these different things for them and sooner or later it was all proven to be false. So, um, and, and you only know by the actions if you can't feel the underlying emotion. When you, when you deal with more and more of your emotion, you'll feel more and more of your own emotions and be very, very sensitive and very open. And as a result, you will also feel more of the emotions of all the spirits around you. And as a result of that, you'll know very quickly which ones are actually darker than yourself, which ones are about the same as your own condition, and which ones are brighter than yourself. Mm. And therefore, you know which ones to listen to and which ones to, yeah. to not to listen help. to as much. Yeah. Mm. The other ones you can help then, mm. yeah. So, like, I've sometimes used a pendulum. Is that, uh, it's not a good idea to use that? Well, kind of um, the kind of spirits, uh, if we just talk about spirit communication for, you, for a minute. Um, were you here yesterday? Yeah. Yep. Um, that's right, you were. I can remember giving you a hug. Um, you remember I talked about soul-to-soul -soul communication? You remember I talked about that? I'll just uh, straighten that up. Um, so remember we have the, f the highest form of communication between spirits and people or people and people is soul-to-soul -soul communication. That kind of communication is preferred by the highest spirits. And, and then the, after that there are literally lots and lots of different types of gradients of types of communication that we can have with spirits. Right down to the spirit manipulating our own body. Right? And, uh, and even then, a lot of dark spirits can't even do that. They can, but they might be able to manipulate objects in the room, for example, where you'll see like glasses being thrown against the wall or those kind of events. So they are the lowest of the communication forms. So there are different types of communication forms. So as you work your way through your own emotional condition, you'll find the lowest form is like having spirits throw things around the room or whatever else to communicate with you. Obviously they're quite angry spirits, otherwise they probably wouldn't do it, and, uh, and also possibly want to scare the living daylights out of you. And so, you know, they're obviously quite fear-based spirits as well who are in that condition. And then you get to a point where they start pulling on your arm or pulling on your leg or, or, or all sorts of things like that. Um, or, um, or giving you a, like a flick in the ear or, you know, just some kind of bodily sensation. So the first one is moving objects, you could say, all right? The next one might be, uh, the next one higher than that generally is, is communicating to your pet, to you via your pet. Like, so usually, you know, pet, pets and animals are, are the next. And then they start communicating to your body just via your body. All right? So, in other words, you know, moving your arm, moving your ear, giving you a flick on the ear, little... Even now, I get something little, in my ear. <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes uh, you'll feel it like a big pr bit of pressure on the side of your head, almost like a headache. Um, a dark, often spirits who become very insistent with you will give you a bit of a pressure on the headache. And, and these kind of things happen because of our emotional condition. When we're at one with God, you won't feel any of these things. But, but because of different emotions that are in us that allow these forms of communication with spirits, and we'll, I can explain to you why if you want to know why that happens. Um, the, what happens is that there is a link given between, because of our emotional condition, it's established a link via which the spirit can communicate with us into our body. And so our body is usually the next form of communication they use with us. Then they start, um, they, they, they can use, so, so you, could say, you could say the pendulum is one of the lowest forms of communication with the spirit. Now, now, that being the case, we can't assume that we, you know, we have a pendulum and we let it go and we go, 
all right, um, are you a nice spirit? <laughs> now, any spirit coming to you <laughs> is probably going to answer yes, will not they? <laughs> Most of the time. Now, some of them won't because some of them are by this stage might have got honest with themselves and they might say no. But, but often you see we're trusting answers, thinking that there's some sort of fantastic thing going on, but really all it is is the spirit telling us uh, via this communication link what they feel. So you, and there's, there's no way of discerning with a pendulum what, who it is. Who you're communicating with, if it's a higher level spirit or a lower level spirit. Yeah. And uh, like I've had people say to me, oh, I was speaking to the Apostle John uh, via the pendulum the other day, and I'm going, I'm sorry, not the Apostle John. And, oh, uh, oh well, well, now that you mention it, yeah, he did get a bit sexual with me, actually. And Apostle John is a gay man, in, even in the spirit world. And, uh, and he, there's this woman saying that the Apostle John was sexual with her. Um, and then I said, well, let's see, it's nothing to do with the Apostle John, you know. Um, uh, do you know who it is? And she says, oh, and then I said, now, just trust your emotions for a little bit. Oh, it's an ex-boyfriend who I had who suicided, who's still trying to connect with me sexually, you know. Like, um, you know, so it went from a spirit in a bright condition who was communicating with her, but now she felt, she allowed herself to feel, she knew exactly who it was, and it was someone in a totally different condition. Does that make sense? So that's the problem with the pendulum. So while you use it, find it, use any of these tools, um, just be very, very careful of trusting the information if you can't feel the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So what about things like tarot and runes? Well, tarot fit into this form, doesn't it, really? Yeah. Um, so you can see you, the next form, obviously, is that I can hear and see. Well, crystals all form... Yeah, well, obviously, um, spirits can manipulate any form of matter uh, in order to make it vibrate so that you can actually hear sound. Now, now that means that they don't know how to do it to your own ear or that you have yet opened your own ear as a, a spiritual ear I'm talking about, not your physical one, um, to actually hear them. Now, my, my suggestion would be if you want to hear spirits uh, actually hear them speaking with you and you're not, then you'd be far better off to actually focus on the emotional reason inside of yourself as to why that particular part of your senses has been turned off because everybody has the ability to hear them without needing some other object. Um, like I hold the crystal, yeah. but, but it's actually, I feel more, it's, I call it a, a diva, crystal yeah. spirit, diva, and, they, and I can write pages and pages of so things. So why do you need the crystal to yeah. write? Because I think it's the diva. And it's not. It. No, it's a spirit. It's a spirit? Yeah. So okay. why do you need the crystal? Can you see you well, must I, have an emotional I reason? Because, yeah, obviously I do, yes. Yeah. Does that make or, sense? Or yeah. the spirit has an emotional or reason the spirit why has an emotional she reason. wants you to feel that it's related yeah. to the crystal. Yeah. Oh, okay. And a lot of times what happens, and particularly when we've come from a New Age background, mm -hmm. is spirits connect with us via different animate forms because it gives us confidence in the actual process. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that as you develop spiritually, you won't need to have any inanimate object in order to connect to a spirit because you actually have the total capacity to connect to spirits fully, soul to soul anyway, and feel everything that they're feeling. Now often if you listen to the recordings that I have of talking to spirits, the spirits will often say to me, well how do you know my life? Like, and how you know a person's life is quite actually easy. What happens is when you open yourself up emotionally, not only does all of their emotions flow into you, but all of their history flows into you as well. Right? And so you can actually read from a spirit or anyone on the earth their entire life. What happened when they were a child, what happened when they were three, what happened when they were five, what their parents were like, how angry their parents were, all these different things just like the spirit can do with you. Now you all have that ability that is yet to be developed for many of you. So, so rather than relying on the crystal, let's put the crystal away for a little while and talk to this same spirit using a, a higher form of communication. So hearing your senses. And then as we go up further, you know, obviously we get to seeing them, right? Uh, we get to a point where at we, we actually see them as a person exactly the same as you, solid, in form. Which I'm scared to do. Which most people are scared to do, let's face it, because you can walk through them and it's a bit scary, right? And so um, there's a friend of ours in Greece who actually stopped driving because... She saw every spirit as a solid form and she was running over spirits all the time when she was driving 
and it freaked her out so much that she stopped driving. Right? So, so um, you can get to a point where you can see to that degree where you see the spirits as solid form and actually communicate them with them in the exact way we're communicating now, which is still not the highest form of communication. The highest form of communication is this soul to soul. And that's the kind of communication that celestial spirits want to have with you. They want to have this emotion to emotional communication. Yeah. So when you're talking, well, not that I asked to talk to a spirit, but if I'm feeling, mm -hmm. so I'm feeling their emotion soul to soul. You, you will often, if, you, if you allow yourself to feel more strongly when you're communicating with spirits, you will often get to the point where you actually do feel their emotion quite a lot in the communication. And, and, and you'll also start to determine when they're actually saying what they really feel or saying, so quite often in communication with spirits, I can feel that what they're talking about is nothing about what they really want to talk about. Like yesterday, uh, that happened with the spirit um, that I pointed out, his own childhood abuse when he was on earth. I could feel that in him, and that is something that he personally wanted to deny, but it was interesting, he asked the question, and that gave me an opening to point out to him that actually it was to do with his own law of attraction too, that these questions were being asked. And I was, and I was trying to work out, is that my question? <laughs> is that my feeling as well? But I can distinguish between his feeling and my feeling. Yes. Um, more so as I pro continue to progress. That's correct. The and, and the issue that many of us face is that we often don't det can't determine uh, the difference between the, uh, our feelings and theirs because we're yet to develop our senses and trust our own feelings. So that is also a part of our development, uh, that we also feel our own emotions and feel what those emotions are. At what stage in the sphere structure do you actually start to um, feel and understand a soul communication with a celestial being? Well, it, it starts as soon as uh, you start receiving divine love, generally. So you could be in any sphere and start communicating this way. But obviously, the closer you get to an at-one-ment condition, the more uh, perfect the communication becomes. When, when you're in an at-one-ment condition, what happens is they will send you a packet of information which will include verb verbals, pictures, and images, and entire uh, descriptions that you could speak about for an hour after a few seconds of, of listening to them. Uh, and I use listening in a very loose term because really it's like a packet download of information. And so a spirit has the, and you, your soul, has the capacity to download packets of information so rapidly that the majority of people would have to speak for days before that they could actually verbally explain it. Well, that actually occurs, um, I find with me, when I wake up, abruptly at night yep. and your body's still I guess in sleep mode but yep. you're fully aware and you do get those packets of information so I get um, a knowing of a person's future yep. from the spirit yep. like 100 years down the track even yep. to the point where they'll predict like 700 years which you, you're capable of being and doing. Um, yeah but not very accurately. Yeah, and but they give you that, all that data instantaneously Yes. and, yep. and then Jane will ask me a question and I can't summarise it because it's just There's so much, too much, much, much to talk about. Yeah. 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 You need to, can you use, use the mic? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, basically, because he ends up waking, I wake up suddenly, yeah. and so he just goes on and all, the, all these things yeah. he says, and then neither of us remember it in, in the, the next morning, morning or especially Anto. Yeah. Remember it and the, the reason so why these ha things, events usually happen in the middle of the night is because at that time you are most connected with your soul in its pure state. See, when we wake up and during the day, we're often so disconnected from our soul and it's our, our emotional condition that's often very much way away from our uh, abilities. In other words, our emotional condition greatly affects our abilities. Now, in the process of just waking up, there's a merging occurring of our emotional condition in our awake state with our emotional condition in our sleep state. And often our emotional condition in sleep state is better than our emotional condition on the awake state, particularly if we have been developing spiritually over a period of time. And the reason for that is that in the spirit world, we know a lot more things than we know of or that we know we can do in the awake state because we're yet to be consciously aware in the awake state that we can do them. And as a result of that, often in that changeover period between the sleep and the awake state, we can have a lot of information given to us. 
the, the issue we face is the issue you're facing, and that is how much of it you retain. And the, the retention of information is very much based around your soul condition in your awake state. And that's why improving your soul condition in the awake state has such a beneficial effect in all forms of your life. AJ, are you able to explain to me, like, this morning at 3.30 in the morning, a snap was up, and I was fully aware, oh, I could, it's almost like I was looking back at the previous, uh, previous evening, yeah. and I could feel the love that was emanating from you two as a couple, yeah. and I could feel the blocks that I have, and to how many... To receiving it. Yeah. To receiving it, and what I don't have, and I could see the wall, almost, that I've put around me, and what I need to work through. Um, what motivated that? How did that occur? <laughs> like, who woke me up? Very often, very often your guides will engineer that for you. Um, so you have a soul desire from what we were talking about last night. Okay, we want to work on some of this stuff. Um, so you guys go, yep, they've got a longing to do that. When's a good time? <laughs> 3.30 in the morning, we'll hit them with a bit of Best truth. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and I felt my hand was being held and I was talking to... Chiro, who was talking yesterday, yeah. and he was processing his emotions, and yeah. he jumped from third to fifth, and yeah. going back and forth, skipping over the fourth because he doesn't need it. Yeah. Um, and Jane then started to cry, and and they were, um, I don't know, there's so many spirits there, and you can see it, and yeah. you can feel it, and just tears are going through, and yeah. it's almost like you're not even aware. The emotions are just flowing so well that you're just you're sleeping basically. Yeah, and the truth is that every single person on the planet does have a whole group of sleep state emotions that they do need to process. And these are quite easily processed in the sleep state once you're aware of the divine love path. Um, the kind of emotions are, for example, the things that you see when you're asleep that you don't see when you're awake. And these range from all sorts of things that happened in your childhood where mum and dad lied to you or they told you things you know, and then when you were asleep you found out that it was all wrong, right the way through to the person you're currently living with cheating on you and you saw it in your sleep state and you, didn't, and you don't know that in your awake state. And all of those different emotions uh, actually enter you in the sleep state and they all need to be released in the sleep state. So there are whole groups of emotions that need to be allowed in the sleep state and once we get on the divine love path, normally our spirit friends help us to release those groups of emotions very rapidly and we're a lot more open generally to releasing them in the sleep state than we are in the awake state. And so we process quite strongly, usually in the first few months of finding the divine love path um, in the sleep state. Um, but then we come up to the, like you could call it the wall I suppose, of now I've got to translate this into my awake state processing. And that's a lot more difficult because we're often very afraid. We're very afraid of living in truth. We're very afraid of acting in harmony with truth. We're very afraid of feeling our emotional state in our awake state. And so what we finish up doing is slowing down then our, in our development because now we've got our awake state emotions that we need to process and they are often much more difficult to process because of our resistance to it. Yeah. Whereas in the sleep state, you've got a lot more trust that it's right. You can see the emotion leaving you. You can feel the reality of it. It's so much easier to process in the sleep state uh, but in your awake state, if you can learn to process with the same ease of all of your emotions, then you will find that whether you're awake or asleep or whatever is happening, you will rapidly become at one with God through the process. Um, from the majority of us, though, what happens is we process quite easily in the sleep state, but with a lot more difficulty in the awake state. Hi, can you pl explain that headache thing again? Because ever since that Budroom one when we did the spirits and the cloaking, I've had a headache ever since. It's, it's like settled. When someone just spoke to the median guy, it, it settled because he said just stop and do what you want to do, which is go on a holiday. So I'm about to go on a holiday before I go to the workshop. Mm -hmm. It stopped, but it, it came back. When you said the headache thing, bang, it came back. And I started to shake a little bit and... Um, I asked all, did I bring any spirits with me? Because I asked, sent out it like a, a you call. You always bring spirits with it, as does no, everyone No, else. no, but I sent out a call. Anyone wanted to come on, sit down, listen yeah, to yeah. Jesus, please come along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, so can you explain that headache yeah. thing? Certainly. Um, spirits can certainly influence your body and therefore give you aches and pains in your body in all sorts of locations, but they can only do so through your denied emotions. So where is the headache? It moves, it moves around, so when I'm watching the videos, mm -hmm. 
I might be crying my heart out and the headaches will get stronger. So there will be one here. At the moment it's here, uh -huh. but it started there. It moves. Sometimes it's here uh -huh. and here, but it tends to be here and it's either above the left or the right eye. Okay. Every place where the headache is, is a location where you have an emotion stored that is influencing a spirit being able to connect to you in that location. Now, now if, it, if it's above one of the eyes and, and, and it's behind the eyes or above one of the eyes mm -hmm. close by and it's quite solid sort of feeling in there, then generally it, it's the suppression of sadness, the left or right eye it being more intense will tell you which gender you're suppressing sadness about at any one point mm -hmm. in time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if, if we're talking, start talking, for example, and all of a sudden you're feeling a terrible headache in your left eye, right, or well, left side is the feminine side of your body. Mm -hmm. So you know that this has something to do with being female. Something inside of you you're suppressing about being, about being female and, and it's about sadness. And there's a spirit connecting with you in that moment and who also has the same emotion that they are also probably denying at the same time that just intensifies that condition. Does that it make makes sense? sense when you're crying it grows stronger. Um, well, if it's going stronger when you're crying, yeah. then uh, it actually is telling you you're not feeling That's your right, own yeah. emotion. Then it's, it's not. So if mine. you're crying, then you're not really crying, are you? If you like, no, it, someone's it, crying via me, type of thing. Spot on. That's exactly what is happening, and you're denying your tears still, but some, you're allowing someone else to cry via you. And that's, mm. and that's very, not very good for you, but great for them. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, at least I'm helping not, someone. But yeah, well, <laughs> but, yeah. but well, you're far better off to help yourself. Of course, yeah. of course. Because they've got, an, they've got a feeling that they can't do it without you. So and, well, and I have a feeling, a feeling I can't, can't do it. it. I think I'll, I'll die, especially yeah, exactly. when I had that fear episode. I, I could not breathe. Like, I could not yeah. breathe. And if that goes on for more than three minutes, we know we get brain damage. So... Nah. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, I've been in that space, and and I've been in states where I've just I've just passed out, and uh, then you totally, breathe. and then I breathe anyway. The body, so so no matter a lot of people have this deep fear about processing all sorts of emotions, and I've been in a state where I have actually physically passed out dealing with emotions, and and the body your body automatically regulates itself in that state anyway. So so <laughs> you don't need to worry so much about all of these different things. It's the fear, actually, of your feeling of grief that attracts this woman in the first place, as a woman in this mm -hmm. case, woman in the first place, who then you allow to cry through you because you're perfectly happy helping another person to cry as long as you don't have to do it yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And you I'm think of what you do in that. therapy. <laughs> yeah. This is exactly what you do, isn't it? Like when, yeah. when you're, you're always trying to help other people do their emotional work. And partly the reason is because you don't want to do yours. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. spot on. So, so what happens then in the, those circumstances is you will start crying, but it's actually not you crying. Because if you were crying, the headache would instantly release. Mm. You follow me? If, if, you, if you're crying and the headache doesn't instantly release, you're allowing a spirit to cry through you. And that is not emotional processing. Mm. Uh, that, that is actually doing your helping thing with a spirit rather than a person on earth. That's all that's doing. And it's not helping you at all. So uh, what I would suggest under those circumstances is just stop because you will be able to stop that quite rapidly like that instantly. Yep. And then ask yourself, oh, okay, I'm allowing this spirit to cry through me because I want to avoid my own sadness. But the headaches like, really haven't eased. So that means well, I've still got a lot of grief. They will there. not ease yep. until you feel your grief rather than theirs. But so it's amazing that it didn't start until that weekend, probably because then I was like, oh, what's going on? Can so I probably... explain why it started then? Yeah. You because... get more and more triggered, more and more triggered. And you, you, it's like you trying to hold a dam of water back. And so you get, somebody's chipping, I'm chipping away at the dam, going chip, 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 chip. Emotion will flow, that will be your emotion. And when that happens, you will not have the headache. So but am I actually in my body now? Can you feel your heart beating? No. A, a little bit, a little bit, but not like walking up a hill. No, but can you feel it, Benny? Can you feel your breath? Yeah, see, yeah. Now you're starting to get back into your body. Yeah, and that, that was like you could feel every single ache and pain in your body. So even something like that is good to just... Very good. 
Very good. Yeah, it's, it's very good to feel every ache and pain in your body. Your body is your feedback system. I know a man who has huge ulcers in his legs that are cancerous mm -hmm. and he doesn't feel it most of the time because he's out of body. Yeah. Mm. So, that, right. so pray, pray and pray <laughs> about why you're resisting your own emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah. And do all of those exercises we discussed with you about staying in your body. Feel your aches and pains. Don't try to get out of it anymore. Don't try to get out of those aches and pains anymore. Feel them and allow yourself to sense what's going on and pray about why am I so afraid? Why am I so afraid to feel my emotions? Just, you know, just stay with that and talk to God constantly about it. And as you do, yeah. what will happen is your awareness will come to the point where you will have your first emotion, your own one. Because at the moment, you have a lot of emotions, but not many of them are your own. Mm. Okay, so because so, I haven't been taking a Panadol or, and all that kind of stuff, because, mm. well, because of my, of course, my liver and my kidneys can't really take it. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, Which is another spirit connected yeah, 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 to that yeah. location. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't been doing anything like that, and I've just, because it doesn't stop me from functioning, so I've just allowed it. Am I being unloving? to myself because it's not debilitating but I'm just aware like I'm still doing my work and everything like that and it's not yeah, see, I, see I would I would question I would say to yourself well okay I'm actually getting myself to work and getting myself to do all these other things but what is my soul's highest priority at this point yeah obviously to heal itself <laughs> okay so 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 if I really did love myself I would be honoring my soul's highest priority which was to actually deal or begin to deal for example if you've got a headache to deal with some of this grief and so I would spend more of my time talking to God about the grief and talking to God about my fear of it rather than even working. Yep. And I know even just with being good to myself, like I'm going my first holiday in 19 or 18 years, but yep. I thought I'm going to do this, I've always yep. wanted to do it. So, so they were good steps. Yeah, good yeah. Steps. yeah. So, I'm, so, I'm, it's, so don't put off loving yourself. Yeah, so even with the headache and... Because I've obviously still got so much fear, like I'm still not taking anything for it. It's kind of like a catch-22. Uh, but I can't you take can. any pain. I can't take any pain relief. The way, the way to love yourself the most is to allow your emotions. So you have to get through the fear first. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, see, everything that's being said to you at the moment, Deirdre, yeah. you're not actually hearing. It's not yeah, I'm probably where the spirits are like, oh, don't hear this, don't hear this. I'm well, well aware of that. Yeah. So, so they are pressuring you to not hear, and you are hooking into them. Why is that? I'm looking into them. Hooking. Hooking. Hooking, hooking into hooking. them. You are, actually, you are actually listening to them more than you're listening to us right now. Yeah, probably, which is why I've got the mic, so I can listen and to it on playback. And it's also why you're babbling all the time. <laughs> and I'll yeah. call it babbling because yeah. you're not actually <laughs> you're saying the same thing over again. Yeah. Right? And much of which you also said last night. Right? So, so just yeah, I didn't hear much of last night, which is why I've got to, I'm going to wait for the playback so I can really listen to it. Yeah. If we just stop for a moment, yeah. though, there's a reason why you are hooking into spirits and listening to them more than you're listening to what you know will actually benefit you. So what's the reason? Uh, I'm probably petrified. Petrified no. of even going where that pain was. I've lived through it once. It's like I'm even... sorry, I have to disagree with totally. Oh, really? Yep. I'm not petrified. No, it's not because of that. See, you're so used to using fear as an excuse to listen to spirits. Let's look at the real reason why you listen to spirits. What does listening to spirits do for you? Mm, I guess... Because no one else hears me, or okay, not, I don't even exist. Starting, now we're starting to. Do yeah, I, I don't think I don't even want to exist. No, full stop. Let's just go back. You, you just had a moment of clarity. Yep. The moment before you said what you just said. Yeah. Like so, no one yeah. listens to me, or anything. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. And and the beauty is, is you know these spirits are listening to you, so you're getting something out of it. You mm. see, you're getting something out of it. And there's lots of sadness about. No one, no ever, one ever listening to me. to me. And so what you're doing is by this desire you have for them to listen to you, you then allow them to influence you all of your life as a result. Yeah. That's your hook. Your mm. hook into them is your desire to have someone to listen to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is the first emotion you need to address. The reason why is because without you addressing that emotion, 
you're not going to hear a single word we're saying to you. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so look at that emotion first. Why do you want these spirits? Because I, they're listening to me. They make me feel like I'm being heard. They make, make me, me feel, feel justifying why make, I'm even here. Yeah, and make me feel like I'm being loved by them because they're hearing me. Yeah. So, so that's the addiction. But you're paying a terrible penalty yeah. for this addiction. Oh, you don't have to tell me. I know the cost. No, no, so I know. no you don't. It's cost me everything, cost me a family, no, it's cost no, me everything. and you're willing to pay it. That's what I'm no, saying. You're right. willing to pay it. You're willing to pay that a bit amount of cost in order to have spirits constantly listen to you. Can you see how addicted that you are to them? Yeah. Can you see the yeah. addiction? Yeah. You're willing to pay the cost of your entire body packing it up just so that you can have somebody listen to you. Oh, shit, that's a shitload of grief, isn't it? It is a shitload of grief. <laughs> Can you see that? Oh, no wonder why I'm scared of it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, now, what you need to do is pray about that. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if you can release this hook you have into them, straight away a lot of your physical ailments will automatically repair themselves. Do, do you understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is at the moment is you keep using fear as an excuse, which isn't your hook into these spirits at all. Your hook isn't in fear. Your hook is your desire to be heard. So I'm not afraid as what I think I am. Yes. You're not afraid as what you think you are. Because I don't think I'm even scared of spirits. If I had them all my life, there's nothing to fear. You love spirits. <laughs> because they listen to you. <laughs> and nobody else on the planet does. <laughs> That's why you love them. Do you see? Yeah. You, you actually are not afraid of them at all. I didn't think I was. No. no. But you're really afraid of the grief. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that I, I don't even know I'm going to argue. And you yeah, are that. so afraid of the grief. This is how afraid of the grief you are. <laughs> you are, here's the, here, here's the grief. And by the way, I'm going to draw the grief like that. There's the grief. And here's how afraid you are of the grief. <laughs> uh, and you are so afraid of the grief that you're willing to pay an even higher price of physical illness, lack of abundance and all these yeah. other things, heaps of things, heaps of things oh, heaps. that you're paying. And you're willing to pay this price, let's call that a dollar price that you're paying. Yeah. It's actually a terrible price you're paying on your soul. Let's transfer it into dollars. You're, million, you're willing to pay a million dollars so that you don't have to feel your fear of that amount of grief. <laughs> when you put it like that, it sounds stupid. <laughs> well, but, but, it's, but it's, it's not stupid because it's in me. Exactly. So, so it's not a judgment. It's, what yeah. I'm saying is that actually your fear of the grief is even worse than the grief itself. But I've got to go through the fear before I can... I've got to go through the anger, then go through the fear to get to the grief. Well, also, you've got to be prepared to pray about the entire yeah. process. And, but, but can you see, it all begins with you willing to pay the price. That's what you've got to pray about. You're willing to pay this price. You're willing to compromise yourself so much just to avoid this. You're willing to pay this big price. And that is a compromise of truth that you're willing to take inside of yourself just to avoid an emotion. That's how much you're And that's just pay. one emotion. That's not even the rest of them. Well, that's the primary ones, obviously. Yeah. You know, because you're willing to have these spirits in your face 24-7. And, of course, you get something from it. And this is your addiction. And this is the trouble with addictions. I right? <laughs> Trouble with addictions is that's how the spirit hooks into us. And now I've got to put up with the spirit influencing this part of my body, influencing this part of my body, influencing this part of my body, in, causing this part to run down, this part to hurt, this part to do this, this part to that. And it's all happening because I'm willing to pay all of those prices just so that I can be heard. This is amazing because you just would never have thought of it. I could have gone lived for a billion years and I even thought of that. That's because you want to avoid your addiction. That's amazing. When you're willing to face your addiction, you will not avoid it. 
So there are all these people on earth in similar predicament to myself because there's quite a few sick people around, obviously. There's a myriad of sick people. Like that, that's why there's a whole medical industry that makes billions and billions and billions and millions and millions of dollars from billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of pharmaceuticals. And they're just not even aware. It's just something no. like... It sounds simple, but I would never have thought of it yeah. on my own. Just never. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm blown away. I'm, I think I'm actually in my body. Am I in my body? <laughs> oh, it sounds like you a dumb question, but it's no, no, not. It's, no, actually, for me, not, it's not a not, dumb question. No, no, no just, just let yourself feel. You're not, you're not letting uh, what AJ's saying to you settle in you. No. You, oh, if I did, I probably would cry my yeah, all if, eyes out. If you let, but I'm hot. Okay, I'm getting hot. Yeah, so. you're starting to connect with your body, but you're not yet in your body because the moment you connect to your body, just about this addiction, you'll have a big cry about the addiction. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like yeah. you'd run out of here crying. Because it, to, to feel that you've been paying for all of these physical symptoms for how many years now? Uh, 41 years. 41 years of physical symptoms based around an addiction and you've just learnt it for the first time. How's that? How's that, That's, so? that when I actually sit on it for an hour and do nothing, I'll probably bore my eyes out, if I'm in my body, of course. <laughs> so stay in your body and do that. Yeah. Just that one exercise. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing the walking and yeah. counting the can steps. I, and I you're talking you... again too yeah. much. Yeah. 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 Can I give you some advice, Deirdre? Because yeah. I have Please. <laughs> with, with addictions. So I've had a lot of addictions, emotional addictions, you know, to different things. Um, in our relationship, I've wanted a lot of things from AJ. And when I didn't get them, I'd get angry. Um, and our whole, I wanted our whole relationship to run on my emotional addictions. And what I found was if I just pray about the addictions and if I'm willing to give up the addiction, I don't need to panic about the fear and I don't need to panic about the little bit of grief. If I just am willing to give up the addiction, my soul will take care of the rest. Yes, I'll still have to go through the fear and the grief, but I don't need to... At the moment, you're freaking out about, oh, I've got that and then I've got that and then I've got It'll that. It'll just be a natural, organic process. It'll just happen, but you have to ha pray about the willingness to give up the addiction and yeah. yeah yep if you can give up the addiction then straight away all these spirits have no way to connect to you straight away your body in certain areas will start repairing itself you'll feel better straight away you'll feel like you'll be able to cope with emotion better because you haven't got a heap of spirits in fear going don't you do this don't you do this don't and to be frank with you they're not in their own fear a lot of the times what they're trying to do is create fear in you right so that, so that they can stay attached. So they say, stay attached. Yeah. That makes it, because uh, my mother ruled me a lot with fear, so yeah. it, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so all, all they're doing is trying to, trying to keep the channel that you have opened towards them continuously open mm -hmm. so that they can remain addicted to you and to get what they get from you which is an ability to live certain things in their life, experiences in their life they're not being able to have if they just were in the spirit world without connecting to a person. See, I don't really get, what, get that because I live so much in my fear. I don't actually do much. So uh, they're wasting their time with me. So what do they get? What do they get? Uh, they, get to, they get a voice. No, they get a person living in total terror. So why would a person want to get a person living in total terror? Why, what did your mum do? Oh, she you, wanted you yeah. living in terror. Yeah. Does it sound familiar to you? Yeah, like absolutely. what the spirits want with you and what, yeah. they, what she wanted? Right. She wanted you living in total terror. She right. succeeded. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And these spirits want you living in total terror too. What does that do for a person, having another person? If I could grab Mary and just terrify the living daylights out of her constantly, what does that, what does that give me? Something not very nice. Yeah, it gives me a sense of power. Her power, yeah. Doesn't it? So, so what's the spirits with you want? What do they want? They want power. Because they just probably feel so powerless. Exactly. Because I, I can see the bigger picture, even though I can't feel anything. Yeah. I can see how everything even affected my mother. I have a bit more compassion for my mother than for my biological father at this stage, even though I just... just yeah. Yep, don't go there, Deirdre. Stop, stop yeah. Deirdre. Because again, you're telling a story, getting out of your body, 
Right, okay. Yeah, I could feel that because now I don't yeah, feel sort of like, as hot. It's sort of like away the mouth goes and away the body goes as well. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, and, It'll and be just... good to come and do the workshop. Will well, you? I'm going to see you Stay 23rd. Yeah. I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. so when you come, before you come, focus on this particular issue that you're Yeah, facing. I will do. I will do. And I'll practice the exercising. And today I've got a, a workout DVD. So yeah. I'll do and what I can. Practice talking less. Right, mm -hmm. and live and, and feeling more. Okay. Yeah, just practice doing that too. You are so you are so acting out your fear, and mm -hmm. it, a lot of it is not even yours. Like what they're doing is they're projecting all of these ra this rage at you, right, in order to control your life, and they're succeeding, and you're allowing it to happen because they listen to you. That's your mm. hook. So deal with the fact that you want someone to listen to you. That's yeah. All. Just focus yeah. on that one thing. Just that one thing. Don't worry about it. Stay in your body. Focus on that one thing. Don't worry about the rest for now. Just that one thing. Okay. There, now, did that go in? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> it went in a little bit. No, a little bit because I'm now getting hot again. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, this, this is big for me to actually be in my body. This is huge. <laughs> yeah. So, so, stop using... See, what happens is you, you use your fear as an excuse to get out of your body. And all you're doing here is hooking back into those spirits mm. all the time. That's all you're doing. And we've had lots and lots of issues with lots of people who, who we've talked to about the, their hook into the spirit. If you don't deal with the hook into these spirits, they will remain like leeches on your back for the rest of your life until you pass. And when you pass, you'll severely regret the fact that you didn't let go of your own addiction. Oh, I could see that. I would just arrive in the wherever it is and just be shell shocked. Yeah. So yeah. instead of doing that, let's look at this addiction, the addiction you have to being listened to, and to be and just focus on that one addiction for for the moment. Yeah. Stay in your body with it, and every time you feel the influence from the spirits, ah, oh, yeah, just hooking back into my addiction, my addiction. Here it goes again. <laughs> just remind yourself. Great. Thank you so much for that All clarity. Right. Can you pass the mic straight behind it? Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, oh, <laughs> bit loud. Um, my question is sort of similar to yours. Um, it's about desires. Yeah. Um, I'm just really interested. I've sort of been learning a lot through Ben, through Alpha shows and stuff. I've got a very limited experience in this, and I'm learning a lot tonight. It's really um, yeah. inspiring to me. But um, my question is that, mm, to be personal, I have maybe issues with the truth and I have a problem with admitting a truth to myself and that is about my desire. And I was wondering if you guys would be able to enlighten me about that. In any way, shape or form. Yep, I feel like you're avoiding an emotion in the question. Yeah, probably. Is the question about what is your desire or is the question about why do I avoid the truth of my desire? I just... This is the truth. I don't know what my desire is. You mean your earth, your desire in terms of passions for what you want to do? Yeah. Or do you mean your sexual desires? Or do you mean your... Oh, no, I know my sexual desires. <laughs> <Okay>. Anything that moves. <laughs> Seriously. But <laughs> if you are single... No, it's not a dating service. But, yeah, no, my question is, is mainly about that I... Um, maybe can't admit a truth to myself that what well, my my passion and desire is I, I don't know how to and I don't know if I'm denying something I don't know if you can help me I'm an over analyzer in living my mind I think AJ you'll answer this question but one thing for me that I learnt about my own desires is that whenever I was in fear it was very hard for me to connect to what was my passionate desire so then I just focused on what am I afraid about and worked on those things. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure AJ will have more things to say than that. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say some really blunt things to you, actually. Yeah, I, I, I would really appreciate that. Yeah. I actually respond quite well to honesty. Often um, where we are sexually is, is often determined by our lack of connection to the soul. The reason why you don't know what your desires are is because you're not actually very connected to your own feelings and emotions very strongly. And that also is the reason why, in your words, you, you're willing to have a relationship with anything that moves. Right? 
not quite like that, is it? But, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, but you also are unsure of your sexual desires as well as a result. And that has created within you this... Uh, in, in some ways, it's created in you a desire for pleasure rather than seeing what your, really, your soul really wants. So um, if I can illustrate that, um, what happens for a lot of people, and this happens very, very young in our, in our life, in our childhood. So let's say this is us, our soul. What happens around us is that we have all of these different pressures. We have the societal pressures. We have our parental pressures that are all determining towards us. They're all, they're all projecting at us what they feel we should do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, all through your life, you've had people projecting at you what they feel you should do. And as a result of that, you've become very sensitive to everyone else's desires and emotions, right? And in fact, responding almost completely to what they want you to do. But you are detuned very strongly from your own desires and passions as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one way for you to find your desires is to actually start focusing on your own soul rather than what you're feeling from other people. Now, this is going to be very, very challenging for you because there's good reason why you're focused on what other people want from you. And that is because if you don't, you've obviously had certain things happen in your past where you've been punished or there's pain involved whenever you haven't given them what they wanted. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what finishes up happening inside of your soul is you start saying, well, I am almost of no value. It's only what the other person wants that determines my value. And how much I can actually fulfill what they want is what determines my value. Now, that is what causes you to get away from your own soul. Does that make sense? Yeah? You're feeling that? That's good. So, so my suggestion is to look at there's a fear that you have and the fear that you have is what others want. Of me. Right? That, that is at the moment the way you're living your life. And this is one, and, and your sexual attractions are also based around this. If somebody wants you, then you feel turned on and you feel great, right? And it doesn't really matter who wants you, you feel turned on and great in that moment. <laughs> and the reason why is, it, that is, yeah. is because you're not in tune with your own soul there either. Does yeah. that make sense? Sure. You're just in tune with the fact that they want you and that's a great thing and it feels good. Does that make sense? Now, when you start focusing on what... Start live, if, you live, if you can start living in truth with people around you. So in other words, notice what they want still, because you're very sensitive and you can feel what other people want from you very easily. So allow that feeling to hit you still, but don't do it. Just experiment for a while. Yeah, it's with, hard. Yeah, it's really hard for you. So don't do it. And then feel what it feels like when you don't do it inside of yourself. Does that make sense? Like, feel, feel that really bad feeling you get inside of yourself, that guilty yeah. bad feeling that's there. It's guilt. Yeah, that you get when you don't give them what they want. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And let yourself feel what's underneath that, because what's underneath that is a lot of childhood stuff about never being able to please uh, people in your childhood. The and this is very similar to what um, I had running in my life uh, and I did find that it was um, a lot of what I was very responsive to what everyone around me wanted and I was playing into that all of the time but when I got deeper into it and I started to experiment with it I realised also that what my parents wanted from me even though I was living hundreds of kilometres away from them and I was a grown woman Still, was still playing in me and either, I was either rebelling against that or still trying to please them all of the time because I desperately wanted this approval feeling from them and I couldn't handle the guilt thing. Yeah. So, yeah. What was your name, to... sorry? I'm Tanya. Tanya. Yeah. Tanya, when, when you actually allow yourself to disconnect from what others want of you, yep. this is really the process for you to go through. It'll yeah. be a big growing process for you. 
yeah, when you when you disconnect through. from what all of those people want then you will automatically start seeing what your real desires are okay. your desires are present and I while I could tell you what they are that's not a very good thing to do I, right? yeah because what you want to do is discover them by actually getting rid of all of what everybody else is telling you absolutely and then just allow yourself to tune into what you really want and you're also going to find from a sexual perspective that you'll start seeing what you really want as well does that make sense and what you really want is not what you just stated to me at the beginning when I asked you that oh, question. Oh, no, I was trying to be funny. Does that, does that make sense? <laughs> so, and I know you're trying to be funny, but there was some truth, <laughs> there was some truth in it, as yeah, you know. Yeah. And, so, um, and so, right, so when you start disconnecting with this, you see, there's an addiction in you at the moment. And the addiction is, if I do what everyone else wants, then I have value then I will be loved, then I will be cared for, then I will be... And that actually, that addiction is... When, if you give up the addiction, it's a bit like if you were smoking all the time, right? And, some, and you wanted to give up. Um, there's two ways to do it. One way would be to deal with the emotional reasons why you're smoking, which might take a long time before you give up smoking. The other way would be just to give up smoking cold turkey hmm. and allow the emotions come up you know, firstly the anger and the frustration and then all the other emotions that come up as a result yeah. of giving up. So this is what my suggestion is to you, is to every single moment, people, you, you're so hooked into everyone in terms of emotions that you, can, uh, so you are a very sensitive girl. You are a very sensitive person. And you can feel very sensitively everyone else's wants of you. Right? And, and it gives you no space to be you, right? You're just so much involved in everyone, give, pleasing everyone else. So what I'm saying to you is for a moment, still notice all of their stuff, still do that, but don't do what the addiction demands. Just don't do it. So, and just sit there, like, you know, <laughs> sit there like this, your hands on there, you just, oh, I'm tired, you know, and feel the emotion inside of you, that guilt emotion, which is driving you to go and do what they want. Just let yourself experience that emotion. And half the time you're doing what other people want without even realising that you're doing that. Yeah. You're automatically in the interaction without even thinking, do I want this, do they want that? You're just doing it. You, yeah. you are so sensitive to what they want that you are often automatically doing it before you even realise that you're actually just doing what they want. That's how sensitive you are to what they want. Which is ironic because I get called selfish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and there, are, there are some rebellious emotions in you, right, um, regarding, you know, rebelling against the status quo and, uh, and that kind of thing in order to get away from this, you know, what others want of me. But in the end, it's very, very hard for you at the moment to actually feel what you desire, truly desire inside of you. And, and, uh, and I feel partly too that what you truly desire inside of you, you have a tendency to judge quite strongly as well because others around you judge it. Um, so you're even hooked into their judgment of what you desire. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I can read. I'm really intuitive and I sort of read, even if I uh, like negative stuff, if I want to feel it similar, then yeah. I'll feel it. Yeah. Like everyone hates me, everyone's thinking this, I know they're thinking that. Yeah. I can just so, uh, I can convince myself of basically anything. Yeah, yeah. So, so there in that place, be very, very careful. So, so you know that, Absolutely, okay, this, yeah. is a, this is a place that's in me where obviously you've had some pretty harsh projections when you were growing up uh, to get into this space where you are so connected with other people that you don't even really know what you want. And as a result, you're just feeding them, feeding them, feeding them, and this is your addiction. To feed them, you get something. What do you get? Well, you get this guilt pr that doesn't, doesn't come up anymore when, if you stop, the guilt would come up again. And it's the guilt feeling you're avoiding. And underneath the guilt feeling is quite a lot of grief that you're never going to please anyone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's really awesome and honest and I needed to hear that. I'm going to go cry and I'll no be worries. back. <laughs> Good on you, Tanya. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> you don't ask a question. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, I guess I'm similar to Tanya. Um, I've only been introduced to a lot of this recently through Ben. Yeah. And I find I'm struggling 
uh, a lot with feelings of being overwhelmed by looking into my past and things that I would obviously need to process. And I think there's a lot of fear about that, but yeah. also just feeling a lot of, yeah, I suppose, yeah, fear of, of where to start and getting started and that sort of thing and the best way and how to... Well, I think start. Ben's given you plenty of advice, but can yeah. I just um, maybe say something? Um, one of the biggest issues we have as males, generally, is to admit to our fears. Like, it's very easy for us to say, I have fear, but it's very, very hard for us to then go and list them all. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. To actually admit that I have this particular fear. So, for example, like one of my fears might be, for example, oh, I'm afraid that, that if I love Mary with my whole heart, that she'll just abandon me for somebody else. So I'm afraid of that. So that's my fear. So I write that down. You know, I'm afraid of spiders. I write that down. <laughs> you know, I write down every individual fear. Instead of actually using this whole general thing of, oh, I have fear. Because mm. the, the problem with using generalities like that is it helps us avoid the specifics. Yeah. And it also gets us out of the emotion. It doesn't help us tune into the emotion. So my, most people I've, uh, who've, uh, I've talked to, you will hear that I've... I've asked them to write down an anger list of all the things that make them angry and all the things that make them angry are also all of the things that trigger some fear in some way and then I get them to write down a list of all the things that they are actually afraid of. Now the beauty of doing that is that when we sp specify our fears we now, and when I did this I think I had 35 pages of them right? so, so, so I had quite a lot of fears right so I wrote them all down like that. And when you specify your fears, what happens is that there's a switch that happens inside of yourself that you now have acknowledged what you're afraid of. So up until that point, it's just been all general. You, know, you haven't really acknowledged any of these individual fears. But now what you've done by writing them all down is you've put in black and white, this is what I feel I am afraid of. And the beauty of doing that is that in that moment, there's just this switch that happens inside of you of allowing yourself to be afraid of those particular things. You see, a lot of our life, we're spending trying to get away from what we're afraid of. So if you can just do that one thing, and then uh, I don't know if you believe in God yet or not or, or what, what your belief systems are, but what I find myself the most beneficial thing to do is I talk to God about the first fear in the list. What I do is, a, next to the fears, I write the priorities. Which one's the biggest one that I seem to have at the moment? Yeah. And then what I do is I talk about that with other people. I'm afraid of this. Have you ever become afraid of this? What, what have you done to get over that fear? And what I've found with every fear is that you have to accept the truth at some point. Now, that's not accepting it here. That's sort of accepting it in the feelings. Like you need, it needs to be a feeling acceptance of the truth. So, for example, with, the, with the, the fear that I had that Mary's going to leave me at some time, like she's going to run away with someone else. That's the fear I've got, let's say. So I write down that fear, and then underneath that, I obviously have some feelings that the reason why she will run away with somebody else is because lots of you guys are better looking than I am and younger than I am and have more abilities than I am. And sooner or later, she's going to find someone more attractive to her than I am. So what's, that, what's really underneath that? What's really underneath that is I don't feel very good about myself and how attractive I feel about myself in re relation to the woman. That's what's underneath that. And if I can allow myself to acknowledge the fear, then I can start getting into the truth that eventually I will have to acknowledge that actually I am just as attractive as any other person. That's the truth I want to end up with. So here I am in this fear. I'm living in this fear right now. And the truth way over here, and instead of trying to get to that truth without doing any work, I just need to acknowledge that's the truth over there. That's where I want to go with my feelings. I want to feel that I am good enough for Mary. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when I feel I'm good enough for Mary, I'm not going to be constantly afraid that Mary's going to leave me at every moment. Yeah. Now, in between that time is going to be some processing work that I need to do. Why do I feel like I'm not attractive enough? So I can, I can do all sorts of things to trigger this. I can sit in front of a mirror and look at me and just say, you know, you're an ugly bastard, aren't you? Like, and just, you know, and let myself feel the emotion that I've had pre obviously projected at me by someone in my past and just allow myself to feel the different emotions that I feel. 
And the more I process those emotions, I'll get to that point in the end where I'll have dealt with the emotion and now have the belief solid inside of me that I, actually I'm attractive enough for Mary to want to be with me. And, and it all began with me firstly just acknowledging the fear that I had. Because if, if I don't acknowledge the fear that I have that Mary is, Mary is too attractive for me, what I will let finish up doing is I'll start acting out that fear. So I'll, whenever she talks to a man, I'll be jealous. Whenever, you know, whenever she you know, goes away, I want to know where she is, you know, ring her up, where are you? You know, we go out dancing together and she, you know, she's, she's dancing on the dance floor and I say, oh, that you know, guy was into you and you were encouraging. You know, and I even create things that weren't even happening a lot of the times out of my fear. And, and this is where, um, if I acknowledge my fear, I can start saying, oh, I'm feeling this terrible, jealous feeling, but actually it's my fear. This is my fear that's going on and I need to feel these fears that are, that are happening. So, so my suggestion, start with an anger list, then go to a fear list, and then just acknowledge those fears to yourself as a, as a start of the process. What they really are instead of just generals, generalities. Yeah. And, uh, and then go allow yourself to choose one of those fears and ask yourself what the emotion is underneath that fear. And it, as you do that, what you'll find is that eventually you'll get so good at it that you won't even have to ask yourself. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like it becomes so second nature, just like many of the other things in your life have, uh, like driving a car or other, other things you might do, have become second nature. And it will become second nature to, to just open up to the emotion immediately. But initially it requires us to have a bit of effort involved. And uh, so that, that's what I'd recommend to you. And obviously Ben said many things to you which he's applying which you'll be able to follow as well but but just that one thing I think will help you a lot yeah thank you